Today we're going to study Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to get started in chapter 4, so we're going to just jump right into our scripture reading. Open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. That shouldn't be too hard to find, because it's on page 3. Genesis chapter 3. We're going to read it all. Now the serpent was more crafty than any wild animal which Adam and I God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you're not to eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman answered the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, You're neither to eat from it nor touch it, or you'll die. And the serpent said to the woman, it's not true that you'll surely die, because God knows that on the day you eat it, eat from it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it had a pleasing appearance, the tree was desirable for making one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her. He ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves loincloths. They heard the voice of Adonai God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. So the man and his wife hid themselves from the president of Adonai God, from the presence of Adonai God from among the trees in the garden. And Adonai called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I ordered you not to eat? And the man replied, well, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And that and I, God said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman answered, well, the serpent tricked me, so I ate. And that and I, God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and eat dust as long as you live. I'll put animosity between you and the woman, between your descendant and her descendant. He will bruise your head, you will bruise his heel. And to the woman, he said, I'll greatly increase your pain in childbirth. You will bring forth children in pain. Your desire will be towards your husband, but he will rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you listened to what your wife said and ate from the tree about which I gave you the order, you're not to eat from it. The ground is cursed on your account. You'll work hard to eat from it as long as you live. It'll produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat field plants. You'll eat bread by the sweat of your forehead till you return to the ground, for you were taken out of it. You are dust. You will return to dust. The man called his wife Hava, life, Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Adonai God made garments of skins for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And Adonai, uh, God, uh, Adonai God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, to prevent his putting out his hand and taking also from the tree of life, eating and living forever, therefore God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out. He placed at the east of the Garden of Eden the cherubim, the cherubim, and a flaming sword which turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. The great Jewish rabbis and sages of long ago point to something pretty interesting in verse 1 about the serpent. The serpent was different from the wild animals that God had created. He wasn't even one of the wild animals. He was not cra just craftier than wild animals. This thing could talk. I mean, look carefully at the wording of the verses. Our English languages our Western culture, our, th these kinds of minds we all have, tend to read in the word other, making the verse read, than other wild animals. But that's not what the scriptures say. It says, than any wild animal. Apparently, the serpent was not even categorized as a wild animal. The serpent was unique. A separate, distinct living being, but in a very negative way. Now, did the spirit of Satan overtake and possess a poor, unwitting snake? Or was the snake a physical form 
that Satan took on, different and apparently appealing, a form willed by his own doing in order to be visible so that he might communicate with Adam and Eve. Satan is able to counterfeit anything. And I agree with many of the ancient sages that say the serpent could well have, the serpent could well have been Satan's attempt to mimic God by creating life. Counterfeit life. Apparently at first the serpent was even able to get around on legs because we see that God cursed the serpent with one of the consequences that he had to crawl now on his belly from this point forward. And of course it was that old serpent that led the woman and then the man to rebel against God. Notice, however, that the serpent was located where? Inside the Garden of Eden, a holy place. Hmm. Now, there is one more example of the Garden, which is a physical, four-dimensional place, being a parallel of heaven, and heaven, of course, is a non-physical, spiritual place that's located outside of our four-dimensional universe. So even what went on in the garden, though, is parallel of what goes on in heaven. Because we know that Satan was at one time in heaven, a special spiritual being, the most beautiful spiritual creature there ever was next to God himself. I don't want to call him an angel. Because there's too many other varieties of heavenly spirit beings than angels. Cherubim and seraphim are spiritual beings, but they're not angels. They are different. They are even more powerful spirit beings than angels. And Satan, called Lucifer in many other Bibles, resided in heaven when he rebelled against God, and he was then cast down to earth for that rebellion. Listen to Luke 10, 18 and 19. Yeshua said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Remember, I have given you authority so you can trample down snakes, scorpions, indeed all the enemy's forces, and you will remain completely unharmed. Isaiah 14, 12. How did you come to fall from the heavens, O morning star? Son of the dawn, how did you come to be cut to the ground, conqueror of nations? Know, please, that only in older Bible versions will we find the word Lucifer in place of the phrase morning star. Lucifer is a Latinized version of the Greek for morning star. And modern translators and Bible editors now realize that using a proper name here, Lucifer, is not warranted. So we actually have no proper name for Satan. So here in the story of the serpent's expulsion from the garden, we essentially have the same story as his expulsion from heaven. Only instead of it taking place in a spiritual setting, heaven, it's taking place in a physical setting, the Garden of Eden. We have the serpent, a very special creature, different than all other living creatures, walking upright in the garden. He's living in the presence of God. Then he rebels. His form changes. He's expelled from the garden. Complete parallel of him being cast out of heaven. This is a, another example of the reality of duality at work. So Satan begins his onslaught by telling an Adam and Eve, God's a liar. In verse 3, after God has instructed Adam that if he eats from the tree of good and evil, he'll die. The serpent says, it's not true that surely you're going to die. And as a result of such blasphemy, the serpent is cast out of the garden. More than that, he's cast down into the dust such that he must now crawl on his belly. 
Satan was first cast out of a spiritual realm, heaven, and exiled to the physical realm of earth. And in Hebrew, the word for earth soil is Adam Ah, Adam Ah. And next, the serpent was cast out of the garden. And he was cursed to crawl on his belly in the Adama, the dust of the ground. Here is another exact parallel, another demonstration of the reality of duality. This event of Adam and Eve's unauthorized eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil is what Christianity calls the fall of man, or the fall uh, from grace, or simply the fall. Now, very interestingly, the Jewish rabbis of old look at this event with a little different slant. Evangelical Christians, because not all denominations see it this way, generally see the fall as the event whereby man's relationship to God was broken and evil came alive in a way that had physical consequences as well, well as spiritual consequences. It was that moment when sin didn't just enter into the world, it became part of our human nature, part of our fiber, I think probably even part of our genetic material. And as a result of our sin nature, we die, not just physically, but also spiritually, therefore eternally. That's why we need a Savior, one who will deliver and rescue and restore us to a condition equal to what Adam was before he sinned. Now, the Jews, on the other hand, see what happened in the garden as a sort of liberation. Very interesting. That is, man was now given the ability and the responsibility to make choices. Prior to Adam and Eve's act of rebellion, they simply did what God said, almost robotically in many of the sages' viewpoints, because there was no other choice. Why? Because there existed for Adam and Eve nothing but good. And good was a single pathway laid out by God, and there was no alternative. But with the introduction of evil by the serpent, mankind gained a kind of freedom. We can now choose for ourselves whether to love God, whether to obey Him, or we could choose to follow our own deceived ways, infected hearts, and do as we wish. And to a degree, mankind could even choose how to follow God. That is, each could work out their own salvation, so to speak. And as a result of this viewpoint, the Jewish people see the purpose of a Savior as generally not about creating a pathway, for an individual to be restored to a right relationship with God, nor has it been about having our sin natures destroyed and then being us being recreated with a new sin-free nature. For a Hebrew, a Savior, a Messiah, a Mashiach, has always been about making the Hebrews, making Israel the dominant world culture. A culture defined by God and lived out as the kingdom of God, which revolves around the ways of the one true God as taught in the Torah. Salvation has been seen as more or less a national issue, and the Savior as the national leader of that cause. But this Savior would necessarily be a man. In fact, he'd be an offspring, a direct fleshly offspring of the greatest warrior king Israel ever had, King David. King David. It's no wonder that so relatively few Jewish people have accepted Yeshua as their Messiah because he simply didn't fit the mold. He didn't fit the purpose that the ancient sages had built for a Messiah. Now, look at chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 8. I don't want to belabor what might seem like a trifling point, but I assure you that what I'm about to put before you has kept many a rabbi 
and many a Christian scholar awake at night trying to discern what it means. The question is this. Was God actually physically walking in the garden? Better yet, does God have any of the physical human characteristics that allow Him to jump for joy or weep bitter tears, swing a sword, other attributes and actions that we recognize as needing a physical body to perform? What are we to make of words just like these that are used throughout much of the Bible? In general, evangelical Christians have a ready answer every time a physical-like attribute of God is spoken of as making an appearance. It must have been Jesus. Perhaps if one reads only the New Testament and ignores the old, then most certainly Jesus would be a logical, though not entirely satisfactory, answer. The Jews have alternative points of view as to what these human emotions and physical-like characteristics ascribed to God intend to indicate to us. Now, I'm not here to convince you of any particular answer, because I have no problem accepting some things as simply mystery beyond the human's human intellect's ability to even ponder them. More and more I have a lot of problems with the very simplistic answers that we so easily accept from our traditional religious authorities. Answers to some really complex, oftentimes vague statements in the Bible. Humans have a tendency to want to fill in the blanks when something in the Bible isn't made readily apparent, but such a thing can be a little bit dangerous. Now, while there is no single Jewish viewpoint on much of anything, let alone any single Christian viewpoint, what I'm about to read to you is of general agreement among rabbis and Jewish sages, there's, but there's a minority of dis dissenting views among very worthy rabbis and scholars. Maimonides, the Rambam, was perhaps one of the greatest, most revered Jewish scholars of all time. He lived in the 12th century AD. Now, rather than paraphrase his thoughts on this particular matter, his view is concise enough. I just want to quote it to you. It's not real long. Here's what Maimonides says about this issue. He says, since matters concerning bodily experience are such, then all words connected to this mentioned in the Torah and in the prophets are exemplary, and they are figures of speech. Principles of this are, he who sits in the heavens laughs, and that they provoked me, Elohim, God, to anger, and as the Lord rejoiced, etc. The sages of old said that the Torah is phrased in our terms. In Jeremiah 7, 9, it says, do they provoke me to anger? Whereas in Malachi uh, 3.6 it says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. If God was really sometimes angry and at other times joyful, then he'd be changing. And such characteristics are found only in the dark and gloomy existence of having a body, which lives in huts of mud created from dust. But God is higher and he's raised above all this. And he continues in another commentary. These phrases are in line with the level of understanding of people, of humans, who can only comprehend a physical existence. So the Torah speaks in terms that we can understand. For example, when it says, if I whet my glittering sword, does God really have a sword? Does it actually glitter? Does he actually use a sword to kill? Such phrases are figurative. Now, I'm going to let you wrestle with that for yourselves. The point is that we need to be reluctant if we think to go about describing our human attributes to God. God's not a man. He is spirit. Yet how else is a being so far above us who operates outside of our realm 
of time and space supposed to communicate with us if it's not on our terms? What other descriptive word choices do we have available to describe the Lord if it's not words that human beings are familiar with? What else do we have? I mean, a clear example of this is in John 3, when Nicodemus was told by Yeshua that he needed to be born again. And this scholarly, very brilliant Pharisee was quite taken aback because he took Messiah's words literally instead of metaphorically. And yes, of course, somebody's going to say, well, but Yeshua was God and he, and, and he was certainly a physical being. Yes. That is, he was God and he certainly had human physical attributes and all that's true. But Yeshua was also a real flesh and blood man born from a woman, a very specific woman, Miriam, Mary, who had to come from the line of King David. Now, although Christ's Father was God. Christ was a 100% human, yet he was also a 100% God. He wasn't a 50-50 bar. I mean, he wasn't part man and part God. He wasn't sometimes man and at other times God. I mean, I don't know about you. I can't, get, can't quite get my mind to picture this. I can't fully comprehend it, just how that means, how all that works. But you want to know something? I know it's true. This is just one of those mysteries that is simply not explainable in any terms that a human being can deal with. It's a God thing. The Bible is just choked, choked with these difficult God things. Here's another one of those difficult God things. The Midrash, the Midrash Rabbah, this is an ancient Jewish commentary, makes a very interesting point by making a connection between some words of King Solomon and what happened as a result of eating, eating the forbidden fruit in Genesis. In Ecclesiastes 118, the Holy Scriptures tell us this, For in much wisdom is much grief. The more knowledge, the more suffering. The Midrash Rabbah goes on to explain that in Genesis 3 6, Hava, Eve, discloses that there were three things about that tree <laughs> that caused an irresistible urge to just well up in her. First, the fruit on it apparently looked delicious to eat. Second, that tree itself was beautiful. And third, the partaking of that tree would give her wisdom. That is, what she was seeking the most was wisdom. Look at the name of the tree. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Her act was largely about acquiring knowledge. And as we go grow older in life, we indeed find Solomon's statement to be quite true. The more you know, the more you wish you didn't know. And when we talk about seeing life, particularly as we're older, through the life, through the eyes of a child, we mean children have not yet learned about all the bad things of life. They still believe that if you just work hard enough, or you dream big enough, or you behave good enough, nothing bad can happen to you. Children have not yet learned that people don't always do what they say they'll do, or that they're supposed to do. Or that some people, for no discernible reason, will hurt you. Some may even take your life your freedom away from you. We call this the innocence of childhood. How is that innocence eventually taken away from them? Knowledge. Knowledge. 
So knowledge and wisdom brings with it its own set of problems. Yet it is a human desire, as with Eve, to seek knowledge, to seek wisdom. Can we accept that not all knowledge is good for us? Apparently not. Because humans seem to have an insatiable appetite for it. Seems that there is knowledge that humans, at least humans that don't have God's Spirit in them, cannot handle, cannot properly discern. It is said we are in the information age, and we have been for about 35 years. Is the world a better place today because of all this knowledge? Or does all of this information available at our fingertips seem to produce at least as much evil as it does good. Are our lives today, is your life, more peaceful, meaningful, fruitful because of this vast expansion of knowledge and resultant technology? This Midrash Rabbah goes on to explain that there was another fundamental at work in this story of mankind's fall. You see, Hava, Eve, distorted God's instructions to her husband Adam, or Adam added to God's commandment about not eating from the forbidden fruit when he instructed Hava. Because when we look at Genesis 2, 16 and 17, we find God saying this to Adam. Adonai God gave the person, meaning this man, Adam, this order. You may eat freely from every tree in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You are not to eat from it, because on that day you eat from it, it will become certain you will die. But when the serpent asked Hava why it was that she was prohibited from eating of that particular tree, she responded in Genesis 3, Two and three with this. The woman answered the serpent, Oh, we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden said, You're neither to eat from it or touch it, or you will die. Where did the notion of I can't touch it come from? Somebody, either Adam, or Hava added it to God's decree. The Midrash points this out by saying in Proverbs uh, 30, verse 6, Don't add anything to his words or he'll rebuke you and you will be found to be a liar. This is exactly the situation we have with Eve, or both Adam and Eve, because some words were added and guess what it did? It proved them to be liars. Man has a real tendency to want to add to God's word, even more than subtracting from it. And this old serpent knew that the instant Hava, maybe Adam, lied, by embellishing what God's instruction actually was, ah oh man, he had him in their grasp, in his grasp. He had him now. It is really dicey to add to God's word. The Hebrews did it, and they do it. Christians do it every day. It's all come to no good. Okay, let's go on to something else. In verse 15, we get this messianic, very prophetic, but if we're honest, very vague statement. I will put animosity between you and the woman. Between your descendant and her descendant, he will bruise your head, you will bruise his heel. <clears throat> Yet here we have so very clearly on in the Bible, early on in the Bible rather, just a peek at God's plan for restoring humanity to himself. Now I have to say honestly, if this was all I had to go on way back in Moses' day or David's day, I don't think I had ever have even remotely seen that statement as a messianic prophecy of deliverance. 
Rather, I just see it as mostly confusing. It's significantly easier in hindsight and with Messiah having come and gone to recognize these and other verses of the Old Testament for what they are, a prophecy of the coming of our Redeemer. Now, sometimes we like to criticize or look down on the early Hebrews especially for not understanding what God's plan was, but it is absolutely typical of man, then as now, to only believe God after the fact. No matter how many prophets God sent to Israel, very few Israelites ever believed what those men had to say <laughs> until after the consequences happened. In fact, look at us, Yeshua's church. Today, the Lord has told us unequivocally, unequivocally, that when Israel returns as, an, as a nation and when Jerusalem is retaken from the Gentiles, things that have occurred actually in fairly recently in history, this is the sign, we're told, we are living in the last days. This is the sign. We're told that Jerusalem and the land of Israel will become a cup of trembling for the whole world. It most certainly has become that. When in all of history was Jerusalem at any other time a cause for anybody but the Israelites to tremble in fear? Oh, the Jews aggravated the daylights out of the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Romans, but never was Jerusalem the center of the world. It wasn't a place where what went on there could destabilize the globe. But it most certainly has become that way in our lifetimes. Well, not some of you, but in mine. We are told that when we see these things happening, to look up. Because our salvation and the end of the world as we know it is near. We've watched these events unfold with our very eyes. We've been forewarned in our Holy Scriptures that this time in history would come. And yet only a relative few within Christ's ecclesia have paid any attention. Very few. Let us vow not to be blind any longer to this incredible time in which we live. Nor be oblivious to what it means, nor passive and how we should respond. In general, when we turn to bli a blind or a disinterested eye towards these events, you know what we're doing? We're behaving just like the Hebrews of old. When God forewarned them of what was coming, and they just kind of sniffed at it. And they went on about their lives as usual. And the results were devastating for millions of Israelites. Now note in verse 24 that God made animal skin clothing for Adam and Eve. Why animal skins for garments? They had already made clothing out of vegetation. They would made clothing out of vegetation for themselves. It, it, it must have done the trick, but apparently it wasn't good enough as far as God was concerned. And this is because... Adam and Eve made their own covering, and not God. And we learn a valuable lesson for this. Man cannot create our own covering for sin. Here we see the end results of the first blood sacrifice in the Bible. Where do you get an animal skin? From a dead animal. Was there death of anything up to now? Seems perhaps not. We don't read of any death at all, although it's difficult to imagine that insects and rodents were eternal creatures. And realize that the context of these verses is the Garden of Eden where the only permissible foods were plants, not animals. 
So these animals whose skins were used to clothe Adam and Hava didn't die from old age, nor were they the product of slaughter for food. They had to be killed for the purpose of making a covering. Here we have another fundamental God principle set down for all time that we must pay attention to. The only suitable payment for sin is the shedding of innocent blood. God had to let one of his own created and innocent creatures die to pay for Adam and Eve's rebellion. Living creatures created from the same dust, same dust of the earth as are humans, given animation, given life from God's own breath, just as humans. They are now having to forfeit their lives in order to atone for the rebelliousness of human beings so that humans can have a continuing relationship with God, although not to the extent that Adam and Hava originally did. Now we hear the term covering in this vein, that it is that shed blood was a covering for man's sins. This is where the notion of blood being a covering comes from. Those animal skins covered Adam and Eve's nakedness. What is nakedness in the Bible? Sin. And the sin it covered was in this instance their rebellion of stealing from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now sin lived in them. And yet when Hava lied and told the old serpent she was not allowed to even touch that tree, she had not yet eaten the fruit. She had not yet gained the knowledge of good and evil. So whether it was Adam's lie or Eve's lie, where did their notion to not tell the truth come from? If the fall of man, the eating of that fruit, hadn't even occurred yet. There's a little head hurt. The ancient Hebrew sages take on this is that God created mankind with both a good and an evil side to us. They call it a good inclination and an evil inclination. In Hebrew, the phrases are yetzer ha-tov and yetzer hara. The good, tov, inclination, and the evil, ra, inclination. So according to this view, hava or Adam or both were just acting out their inherent evil inclinations when they first added to God's commandment by including the words, don't touch it, and then second, when they deliberately disobeyed his commandment by eating the fruit that God had unambiguously told them not to. Yes, Hava tries to deflect blame. She says, it's that serpent. It's not me. It's him. But is that really the case? All the serpent did at first was to ask a question. And Hava's response was not the truth. Once she told a lie, the gate opened, and the devil merely led her to the next inevitable step, disobedience. This really stings most Christian doctrine on the subject of evil and the fall of man, but it's hard not to see that at least these Hebrew sages have a point. After all, if God created everything, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil was his creation, put by him into the garden that he created, then evil must have predated mankind. Or did evil just self-generate? Did evil simply appear out of nowhere? Or was evil actually part of creation? We're not going to debate that headache-producing subject today. But we will look more closely at the subject of good and evil, look very closely, closer than you might be comfortable with, when we get to Genesis chapter 6. 
If we're honest about what the Scripture says and what it does not say, then the pre-existence of evil before the creation of humans cannot be taken as a simple, cut-and-dried, easy-on-our-conscience matter. In verse 22 we get another piece to the puzzle of just who God is and what His attributes consist of, because we get this statement. Adonai, God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, to prevent his putting out his hand and taking also from the tree of life, eating and living forever, and then that statement corresponds with another statement back in Genesis 1. Verse 26, then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, and the likeness of ourselves, and let them rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the animals, and all over the earth, and over every crawling creature that crawls on the earth. Note also that Adam and Eve were removed from the holy place of the Garden of Eden. Mankind was now separated from God spiritually and physically. A barrier was erected between God and man. God put an angelic guard on the approach to the Tree of Life to keep Adam and Eve away from it, since they had already proven that they were not trustworthy. God couldn't allow them near it. In fact, they couldn't even be allowed to stay inside the garden anymore. God cannot allow uncleanness and sin anywhere near His perfect holiness. Notice again, though, that direction, east. God placed His angelic guard at the eastern approach to the garden. Apparently, there was an entrance into the garden from the east. So we now have the garden in the eastern part of the land of Eden, and the angel placed at the eastern end of the garden. We see a whole, we're going to see a whole bunch more of east as we move along in our studies. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. We're going to read the first nine verses. Genesis chapter 4. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is page 4. We're just going to read verses 1 through 9. The man had sexual relations with Hava, his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, Cain and said, I have acquired a man from Adonai. And in addition, she gave birth to his brother uh, Hevel, Abel. Hevel kept sheep. Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought an offering to Adonai from the produce of the soil, and Abel too brought from the firstborn of the sheep, including their fat. Adonai accepted Evel and his offering, but he did not accept Cain and his offering. Cain was very angry, and his face fell. And Adonai said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why are you so downcast? If you're doing what's good, shouldn't you hold your head high? If you don't do what's good, Sin is crouching at the door. It wants you. But you can rule over it. Cain had words with Havel, his brother. Then one time, when they were in the field, Cain turned on Abel, his brother, and he killed him. And Adonai said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? And he replied, I don't know. Am I my brother's guardian? Here we have Cain and Abel, sons of Adam and Eve, and we have the first recorded, underline recorded, murder. Although by now there were apparently many inhabitants on earth, so this, this may not have been the first killing of a human. We don't know. But before that event, we are witness to God accepting one sacrifice, an animal, but not another one. Food from the ground. Plants. Once again, God reinforces the fundamental that only innocent blood is suitable for atonement. Hebrew names have great significance. The ancients 
tended to name their children after some event or an attribute or, or a hope that was of current significance to that family. So it works to our advantage to learn what these biblical names mean because it gives us an insight into both the mindset of the people involved and into the events that were shaping their lives. To be clear though, Cain was not a Hebrew because it'd be hundreds of years after the forthcoming great flood before the first person would ever be designated a Hebrew. So what we're talking about here is the forerunner of the Hebrew language, which by the way was Akkadian, not the Hebrew race. Cain, Cain means acquired from God. It appears that Cain was probably Adam and Eve's first child, and because it was a male child, and because of the name, the name Eve gave to him, it appears that Hava made this connection that we read about, read about rather a little earlier concerning how Eve's seed would bruise the head of the serpent's seed. She must have logically concluded that this was the man that was going to deal with the serpent, Satan. And then we're also told that Cain uh, was a farmer. Well, next to be born was Evel, Hebrew for Abel. Evel was a shepherd. Now, there's some disagreement as to what the significance of the name Evel, Abel, is. Some scholars say we can deduce no meaning from it. However, others say that Abel is taken from the Hebrew word Hebel, which means breath or vapor. And it carries with it a sense of being transitory, here for a moment, then gone. And we're told precious little about either brother. But we do know there was a time at which they were summoned by God to present a sacrifice, an offering to Him. And as there was no sense of surprise or unexpectedness assigned to verse 3, bringing a sacrifice to the Lord was probably a regular event. At the least, this was not the first time a sacrifice for the Lord had taken place. Now likely the altar where the sacrifice took place was located at the entry to the Garden of Eden because they would not have been allowed into the area that God dwelled. They would not have been allowed into the garden. Now we're told that God accepts the offering of a slain firstborn sheep from Abel, but he rejects the plants that Cain brought. The question here, of course, is why did God rebuff Cain's offering? There's a couple of very likely possibilities. First, it was likely that the particular kind of sacrifice offered was either a burnt offering or a purification offering, in Hebrew an olah or hat'at. And the only suitable sacrifice before God for either of these two types of sacrifice is, is life, innocent animal life, which is exactly what we're told Hevel brought as his offering. Now it's neither certain, or rather it is, it, it is a very nearly certain that uh, all the ritual and requirements we find in the Leviticus for sacrificing was not involved here. It was simpler. It was more straightforward. There's no mention of a mediator or a priest of some sort. But the point is that these two brothers would have full well known what God expected of them because they grew up with it long before these two were born. God had required their parents and given them a commandment by way of instruction for wearing animal skins. God made this requirement. And they were reminded of it 24 hours a day because that's what they were wearing. Another interesting facet of the sacrificial issue concerns the nature of the produce from the field that Cain brought. It was ordinary. Genesis 4.3, in the course of time, Cain brought an offering to Adonai of the produce of the soil, and Havel too brought the firstborn of his sheep. Abel's sacrifice was the more valuable firstborn, a male animal. 
But as for Cain's produce of the soil, there's no mention of it being first fruits or the best of the field or, or anything that would make it set apart from any of the other produce. Now, the sages don't fully agree on the nature of the deficit of Cain's offering. Some say he shouldn't have brought plant life at all, that it should have been an animal. Others say the problem was the haughty, non-repentant attitude he brought with his offering, but that's not really described here at all. Still others cite what we just discussed, that it was just ordinary produce and not the best, which is a must if it's to be offered to God. Well, let's remember one thing, though, that at this time, man was only to eat plants. Animals were not on the menu. Therefore, the purpose for sheep in this era was not for meat. Rather, it was for sacrifice and it was for clothing. It was for covering. The animals Havel was producing could have served no other purpose than as a service to the Lord. And for wool or skins for clothing, maybe, maybe tents. So we could further combine these two purposes for the sheep under one title again. Covering. Interesting, isn't it? I hope you see this. The sheep, the lamb, was to provide covering. Clothing for a man's nakedness. It was also to provide covering by its own innocent blood for a man's spiritual nakedness. Our sin. But at this time, it was not meant for nourishment. We're going to continue with this chapter next time. Please rise. Yes, you